to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So a couple months back, we talked about the different requirements in order to become an officer. We talked about what we think they should be. And one of those is the physical fitness. But at the time, we said we were going to put a pin in that. We were going to hold off having this conversation until a later date. Well, that later date is here now. Exactly. And what a better time. Chief Master Sergeant Bass just announced that there will no longer be delays in bringing the PT test back. The PFA is starting July 1st. And yeah. so it's something we haven't paid enough attention to. It is an important aspect of our career. Whether you're an airman, whether you're an officer, doesn't matter. Fitness is a big deal. And we're going to talk about this idea of fitness and how important it is. Yeah. And we're not going to do it on our own. We're going to have some help here. These next four episodes that we're bringing you actually come from the Barbell Logic podcast. So this is not an endorsement of Barbell Logic, though we do greatly appreciate what they do. This is possible because as of a couple months ago, Reed, I now work full time for Barbell Logic. I left my position with Brainstorm and got hired on at Barbell Logic. I had already been working for them part time, but they took my position, made it full time. So now I'm their director of external relations, where I have conversations with outside partners, such as other publishers, other podcasts, in order to further the growth and development of Barbell Logic. And I asked the question of Matt Reynolds, the founder and CEO of Barbell Logic, if we could use these episodes from the military series that they put together, which I helped them put together, by the way. And he was more than willing to let us rebroadcast the show, add some commentary to it. And then the plan is to have him come on for an interview to talk even in more depth about his company and the importance of fitness, how it helps us as officers. And so we're super excited to bring all of this information to our audience today. Yeah, absolutely. And Colin, we've made mention before how important it is for us to bring material to our audience without external influence, if you will, right? So we haven't had sponsors on our podcast. And we will not have sponsors. This is all very deliberate, but we want to make sure that we're being as open and upfront with you as we go on this journey so yes, you're going to hear about Barbell Logic and the things they do. Colin, you and I are going to be taking a much broader look at this. Worth talking about fitness, big F fitness. How does it yeah. fit in with the entire concept of military service, of officership, of leadership? But there was such good information in these podcast episodes that why reinvent the wheel? They'd already hashed out a lot of these really good concepts, and there's just a lot in there that we want to bring to you, and we're looking forward to sharing this really, really good information with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Reed, I think that is a good place to leave the explanation for the series that's coming up this month. Yeah, so for today's episode specifically, you're going to hear from Colonel Scott Conway. He is a colonel in the Marine Corps and has extensive experience in the leadership development side of things. He was an instructor for OCS, which is the Marine Corps equivalent of OTS. It stands for Officer Candidate School. And he is now currently instructing officer candidates for the Marine Corps in the Northeast. And then combining all of that with his experience as a logistician for the Marine Corps as an officer, he has some really fantastic nuggets of information that will be useful to anyone who listens to this, whether going into the Marines, joining the Air Force, the Space Force, there is just such great information here about being a leader. And 
we are super excited to bring it to you today. Yeah, he does an excellent job of showing exactly what we were describing, how central your fitness is to your ability to be an officer. Really good way to kick off the series. Looking forward to having a discussion about it. All right, so let's turn it here over to Colonel Scottway and the Barbell Logic Podcast. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is the military series. I'm joined here with my co-host, Nikki Sims. Hello. What's up? Hello, hello. Excited to be joined by Colonel Scott Conway, Colonel in the Marines, friend of ours, not a Barbell Logic client. Want to walk through this. Scott's going to be a guest on this series numerous times. And it's important for us to communicate and for Scott to communicate that he is not representing the Marines in these conversations, nor is he representing Barbell Logic. He's not getting paid to do this. He's, again, not a client. He does have a particular relationship with one of our coaches, i.e., he is the husband of <laughs> Jillian Ward, <laughs> who is our director of nutrition. Which you can't technically sign up for that kind of service online. We don't have that offer yet to wed one of yes. our coaches. <laughs> that, should be the, that should be the ultra premium service we offer. We've been talking about that. I'll do it like, hey, for $25,000, you get your strength coach and a spouse. <laughs> and we'll come out with a YouTube series kind of like the marriage game. Anyway. That's perfect. So welcome to the show, Colonel Scott Conway. I don't know how I can follow that introduction. <laughs> I'll just sit here and smile. So you are a lifer Marine. I am. That is a, a way to say it. I'm a career Marine. Career Marine. So does that mean like since high school? So I haven't been a Marine since high school, but I have been in the military since 1988 when I graduated high school. Okay. So even before you went, you and I have talked before, so I know part of your story is going to be going to the Naval Academy. At what age did you know that you wanted to be, first I would award this as generally in the armed forces or a soldier of some type, and then at what point were you like, I'm going to be a Marine? Did those happen at the same time? No, they didn't. My grandfather, my father's father, was a sailor in World War II. He was drafted, he served on a destroyer tender, and he had the best stories. Yeah. And Thanksgiving, Christmas, and he told him so often, he could have just said like, hey, number 19, and we all would have busted out laughing because it was the same stories. But I loved every single time he told them. My brother, my older brother, actually went to the Naval Academy before I did. He was class of 85. So I got to watch him go through the process. He's eight years older than I am. And just growing up with a military family and, and a family of service and watching my brother go through it, I, I realized there's something to this that's calling me. Ironically enough, I did not know I wanted to be a Marine. I'd always sort of felt a calling towards it, but it wasn't until my last year at the Naval Academy when I worked with a very influential mentor of mine that I realized I didn't fit in to the mold that I thought I was going towards in the United States Navy, and I made the decision to go in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is in the Department of the Navy. Yes. So we're sort of a sister service, two for one, if you will. A lot of civilians probably don't know that. Subtle nuance. So, i.e., you were basically a knuckle dragger, and they were like, hey, you're just not smart enough to go into the Navy. We think you probably should be a Marine. It's jarhead time for you. I am bigger than you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Oof. And you're like, okay. <laughs> you're in the Naval Academy. You were prep school first. Right? It was a five-year program yep. for you. Five-year program. I went to uh, Newport, Rhode Island. I had to enlist in the Navy to go there. Finished up my year there. And then four years in Annapolis, Maryland. And then a smaller percentage of the graduating class can go Marine Corps. At the time, it was 16 and two-thirds percent. And then the rest go into the Navy. Interesting. So it was a fast and furious five years, but I think it did a great job getting me prepared for what came after that. I'm going to ask a really ignorant question. When you go to the Naval Academy, do you get a normal college degree, like a bachelor's degree? Do you graduate when you graduate from the Naval Academy? I have a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. That you got at the Naval Academy. Yes, at the Naval Academy. Yes. Right. Do they specialize in certain, I mean, every college specializes in certain degrees. What are their fields of study, math, engineering, hard sciences, things like that? There's generally, there's three tiers of degrees. You've got your hard sciences, the engineering degrees, and then you've got sort of the math and physics. Not, I don't want to call them general sciences, but then you've got your humanities, the English, history, political science, etc. So, I mean, it has a full spectrum. It doesn't have every major. Now they're going into a little bit more of cyber. So, 
I mean, it's definitely keeping with the times, but you're not going to have some of, and, and please forgive me if anybody's listening that has one of these, some of the fluff majors. You couldn't get a literature degree sure. there because it just basically we're becoming warfighters upon graduation. So it's generally a, more of a technical type school with a lot of leadership thrown into the curriculum. How hard was it? Very. Did you love it? Was it a challenge? <laughs> I won't ask if there were things you hated. So I'll say like, what did you love the most? And then what was one of the most challenging things of the Naval Academy? There is a saying about the Naval Academy. It's a tough place to be at, but a great place to be from. And it, it's absolutely true. You know, one of the most difficult things is that everybody plays a sport there. And really, what do you play? Well, it's a combination of varsity sports, there's club sports, and then there's intramurals. You must do something. Mm. You don't just get to be a purely academic. Hmm. So you layer in the academic piece, which is substantial. Then you throw on top of that commitments for whatever sport it is that you're doing. Now, it could be intramurals, like I said, and that's a little bit less of a commitment or all the way up to a varsity sport where you're in the weight room in the morning and then you're at practice in the afternoon. And then there are leadership responsibilities that you have thrown on top of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I said there's leadership in the curriculum, but you are basically training, the brigade is training the brigade of midshipmen. So when you are freshmen there, we call them plebes, they have a lot of responsibilities. And it's a lot of memorization. You have to know two meals in advance, a very specific menu that you have to memorize. And then you have to learn about weapon systems of the United States and weapon systems of our peer and near peer competitors. So all of that is on top of it. So it's time management becomes absolutely essential. I think the hardest part is in high schools across America, there's a stratification of students. And whether you are more focused on the college prep program, very academic, involved in student leadership, team captain of your varsity sport in high school, those are the types of people that apply to the Naval Academy. And you might be the proverbial big fish in the small pond. And then you get to Annapolis and you're surrounded by people who are just like you, except they're all better. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's how it felt when I got there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that's a very humbling experience to walk in and realize you're not a big deal anymore. But I would assume there's a tremendous standard set and yeah. you've got to rise to the standard, right? It's really cool that I'm sure the standard at Annapolis is significantly higher than it is at the state universities in general. Right? And it's not throwing them under the bus. It's just that the Naval Academy has a reputation for having a tremendously high standard. Everybody has to meet it. Well, you know, I would say it's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. You should be a politician. You should go into politics. Please, no. <laughs> it so is better. Voice. Cool, whatever you say. It's yep. better. Um. I'll say it's better. <laughs> I want to be Nikki's assistant. That, that's what, you know. That'd but again, I don't work for Barbell Logic. Let me make that clear. Um, <laughs> But no, when you go to a state university, they may have a very specified program that is more rigorous than one that might be in Annapolis. Okay, that's fair. It's just a slice of all the things that you have to do while you're at that school. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, hovering over all of this, like the cloud, when you graduate, you are going to be an officer, right. either in the Navy or the Marine Corps. For a fact, you are entering into military service the day you graduate. Mm. So you definitely take the studies seriously because you're playing for keeps at that point. On day one, you were expected to execute. The leadership stuff that you had to do and the memorization and things you were talking about, is that, for all intents and purposes, is that classroom work? If I think about when I was in college, taking a, I had several semesters where I took 21 hours or 18 hours. I think those were the, my two biggest. That was crush me. Is that part of that or is it, would you take, would you take 15 hours, 18 hours? whatever of college curriculum, and is some of that the leadership stuff? Is the leadership stuff like completely separate? So the memorization, the things that we, memorizing the menus, memorizing the weapon systems of, of foreign militaries, that is the internal brigade training that takes place. You walked around with your pro book, your professional knowledge book, and there were topics that went by every week. But in the curriculum itself, within the academic curriculum, there were naval science courses, whether it was navigation, on the water or whether it was a military history course or something. So that was weaved into the program. And it doesn't matter if you are a humanities major, if you were an English major, you were going to take electrical engineering, mm. you were going to take weapon systems engineering. So there was a, another layer of classes that were thrown on top of that. What were some of the leadership qualities you learned that you still find very useful today? Humility. When I said earlier, you go from being kind of a big deal in high school and you realize that you're not. 
And then through the transformation that took place over the five years uh, that, that I was involved in the four-year program with my one year of extra credit, <laughs> and then pretty much every year in the last 28 years, it's reinforced. It's not about you. It, it is never about you. It's about what you can do for your people. Those young men and women that have been placed in your charge, that is a tremendous responsibility, and it's all about them. So we live and die by the phrase, mission first, people always. So I think when you get out of your own way, you realize there's something bigger at stake. I think that's probably the best lesson that I learned. What sport did you play? At the prep school, I played soccer and lacrosse. And then when I went to the Naval Academy, I played lacrosse. Okay. And I was exceptionally mediocre at it. So <laughs> I've joked with him before, Nikki Sims, that that was the term he used as when I say I was painfully average is my, oh, yeah. the mm -hmm. term I use for myself. <laughs> how, how hard was the physical training in the Naval Academy? And follow-up question of that, especially then compared to, I assume you left the Naval Academy and you did you immediately then go to basic training because you hadn't done that yet and you entered basic training as an officer? Is that right? So at the Naval Academy itself, plebe summer, which is the orientation that you've got at the Naval Academy, it's about six weeks long. Every day starts off five o'clock in the morning, Reveille sounds, and you go out and you do physical training. And it's kind of a rude awakening for recent high school graduates. Fortunately for me, I had the year at the prep school and I had grown accustomed to that. But then really after that, it goes to what's your sport? So I worked with the lacrosse team for the first three years, go JV. And then <laughs> my last year, I switched to intramurals and there I got to diversify a little bit. But that's at the Naval Academy is where I really started the endurance track of my athletic career, if you want to call it that. Why do you think athletics are so prioritized or important? Sports provide a tremendous testing ground. It provides you the opportunity to experience adversity. It provides an experience to have teamwork. And again, depending on your sport, if you're out there as a track athlete, you may not necessarily be running as part of a team unless you're on a relay but you are competing for the team. So even our individual sports uh, have a, a teamwork aspect to it. And I think in athletics, you realize that many hands make for light work. So for us, it was the camaraderie of the team. It was learning how systems work together. And quite frankly, it's a tremendous leadership proving ground on, mm -hmm. on the athletic field or on the courts. That's not really as supported when you leave college, Naval Academy, anything like once you are serving you're just doing just i'm using air quotes doing your job <laughs> well so i think that's one of the and matt and i think we can talk about this in our leadership conversation but that's a very difficult transition to make because at the naval academy you're coached mm -hmm. and almost every minute of your day is i don't want to say it's scripted but you know it, it's scheduled we have mandatory study hours. We have three meals a day that we've got to, to participate in. You do not get to skip class. It's not even an option. And there are some disciplinary things that could happen as a result of if you do that. Then you get commissioned. And I'll speak specifically of the Naval Academy. I can't necessarily speak for anybody who went, had the, I'm um, using the quotation marks, the normal college experience. As a second lieutenant, I was making choices of my own. And I didn't always make the greatest choices, especially as a younger officer. And it took me a while to recalibrate my brain and realize I may not have a team, I may not have a coach, but I am responsible for my individual level of fitness. And I sort of rekindled my love for the endurance sports after I had that epiphany. So you went to the Naval Academy in 88, 89, right? Somewhere in that ballpark? 89, I got there, graduated in 93. Got out in 93. So that was Desert Storm years, right? I watched it on CNN, yes. Yeah, it wasn't one of those things where you joined because of, it actually occurred while you were in school, right? Was, was that 90, 91? Correct. Somewhere in that ballpark? Yes, yeah. Man, I remember that too, right? Was it a Wednesday night? I, I think I, we were at like at church and I can remember, if I remember this right, that George Bush had basically said, it threatened, is this right? Threatened that if Saddam Hussein doesn't pull out of Kuwait by this time, it's on. And they were playing chicken. Is that, I mean, kind of, not really. And then it was on. And the next thing you knew, we were lighting up Iraq. And Wolf Blitzer was broadcasting from a hotel. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And this was one of the very first, Vietnam was televised. It was on the evening news, but this was with a 24-hour news networks. So right. You were watching things happen live. Yeah. So it was incredibly interesting to be at the Naval Academy and realize that's where I'm headed. 
Were you excited? Were you scared? Were you both? At 19, 20 years old, you were so motivated to get involved. Yeah. You just wanted to, you're like, I don't even really need this degree. Let me go get involved. I mean, those are the people at the Naval Academy. They're the ones, like, that's what you signed up for. No sure. one wants to join the military and not do anything. You want to actually get to exercise your craft. So we were chomping at the bit. So when did you first get deployed? Was it to Iraq first? So I did a United Nations deployment in the Western Sahara, and that was interesting, but irrelevant to this conversation. That'll be a good one for a sidebar. My first combat zone deployment was to Afghanistan in uh, November 2002. Oh, wow. Obviously, September 11th, 2001, that was, the, sure. uh, that was the big one. But I got there in November 2002, and it was still pretty expeditionary out there at that particular time. Yeah, those were the crazy years. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed, they were. Things were nuts for three or four years there. Right. What are some of the you know, take-homes, some of the things that you learned in these deployments? You said you've been to Afghanistan twice, is that right? Afghanistan twice, Iraq twice. Okay. I lived and worked in Japan, in Okinawa for two years. So, yep, I've been all over the world. So I want some stories, stories you can tell, and especially if they've got sort of a take-home lesson there of some of these deployments. What were some of the things that you can at least talk about enough that were learning experiences for you or that were just nuts? Stuff that I will never get to experience as a civilian. So I was in Iraq. Specifically, I was in Fallujah in 2004, 2005. And that was a very difficult place to be during those particular years. And at the time, I was a major and I was a staff guy. I literally sat behind a desk and a laptop. That was my weapon. And there was a situation that came up and I traveled a lot. I would hop on a helicopter and fly to Baghdad, then I would fly back. And But the thing is, if the helicopters, like if that didn't work, you went via ground. And I think the most difficult lesson for me to learn was you can't be afraid of dying. Hmm. If that is your greatest fear, then that's going to drive every decision that you make. And there was one scenario in particular that I had to go on a ground convoy to and from Baghdad. It was only 33 miles away, but we got ambushed. You know, I mean, imagine... On the highway? Yes. Yeah. So good old MSR mobile. Imagine we're wearing all the gear that was appropriate in 2004. I had the body armor, the helmet, I had the rifle, the pistol gas mask, I mean, you name it. And that stuff's heavy. And I realized very quickly, I wasn't the convoy commander, but I was the senior guy on the convoy. So that's the beautiful thing about Marines. It's just, we work together. And because every Marine is a rifleman, everybody has an idea of what to do. It may be a pickup team, but you're at least a team. So we had to work our way through. And as I'm running back and forth the length of the convoy many, many times, I realized, and I believe it was DJ Quick and Sugar Free that says, <laughs> if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. So good. And the benefit of being in shape, it's like it kept me alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you talk about planting the seeds for trees you may never see. All of those hours, all of those miles, all of that effort that I had put into my training before that paid off that day, and it kept me alive. How many Marines were in your convoy? You were ambushed? So that one we only had, it was a handful of Marines. It was about a platoon. So let's say about 30 Marines, but we were escorting a convoy of... That's six handfuls, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. I, I get it. Sure, Matt. Your sure, show, 30. you get to... Sorry, you get to, sorry. Okay, so you got 30 Marines. You get to do the math. Forget the degree that's hanging on my wall. Okay, <laughs> you were so, escorting... Uh, yeah. <laughs> We were escorting uh, some some local nationals and some contractors. Okay. So all told, there were about 60 people in the convoy. Oh, okay. It's pretty good size. And then did an IED deploy first? Were snipers bullets hitting the Humvees or something? Or like, how did you know? Like, oh, shit, here it is. We're getting... Well, when the vehicle in front of you explodes, that's pretty much mm. when you know. Okay. Something's not right. Something's Holy going cow. on. So it was an RPG mm. that took out the vehicle that was right in front of me. And sadly enough, it was one of our contractor's vehicles. Mm. Don't drive around in the prettiest vehicle in a convoy. That was one of the lessons I learned that day. They were in a Mercedes or something, or it was a uh, it was an up armored H two. Yes, so right. a Hummer H two, not not a Humvee like you right. would think of military, but this right. was a shiny black H two commercial. Right. So yeah, yep. So it was RPG, and as it was a complex ambush, they took out that vehicle, and then they waited for us to gather around the vehicle, and then they opened up with small arms fire. Ugh. So, and by virtue of the fact that it was a commercial vehicle, 
we had a very difficult time getting into the vehicle to take out those who unfortunately are no longer with us and those who were wounded. Mm -hmm. So we were fairly exposed for a pretty good amount of time. How long were you in a firefight? I have absolutely no idea. Even afterwards, after like debriefing, you I don't know? I have no idea. Wow. If you remember, and again, I'm not trying to advertise movies or products or services or anything, but if you remember the movie Saving Private Ryan, where Tom Hanks comes off the landing craft in the beginning oh, and things God. just slow down. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. They nailed it mm -hmm. because that's exactly what happened. It could have been five minutes. It could have been five hours. Mm -hmm. I would be hard pressed to tell you how long it was. I want to say all told, we were probably there for about 45 minutes. Wow. We are going to talk, I think, in the next episode about the OODA loop a little bit. And what was it like actually being in this scenario? Did your body just perform as it had been trained to? One of the reasons I asked is if you don't know how long you were in it, Mm -hmm. It almost seems like there was like this efficiency, neuromuscular efficiency, like the pathways had been laid for you to do your job. I mean, what was that like? So at the time, I was an endurance athlete. I was not a strength athlete. I didn't do barbell lifts. I didn't do any resistance training. I was as crazy as this sounds. I was a staff guy. My running partner happened to be the senior enlisted advisor for the unit that I was with. And he would tell me, hey, sir, I got a flight tomorrow morning at 5. I'm like, okay, so we'll, we'll I'll catch you on the next day. He's like, no, 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 we're going to run at 3.30. Hmm. So I was probably logging in 60 to 70 miles a week running. Oh, my God. Yeah, wow. crazy, crazy. And remember, when I compete in endurance sports or when I competed, past tense, I was the Clydesdale, over 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was probably about 210. Jeez. And then you add on all the gear. <laughs> so, yeah, it was I was a pretty heavy guy walking down the street. But... For me, it was when I was running back and forth, I wasn't even thinking about, oh, I'm getting tired, I'm getting this, do I need to rehydrate? It was just, I want to live. Mm -hmm. I want all of these people to live and I want them to stop shooting because I didn't do anything to them to deserve this. It's crazy what thoughts go through your head. But when it was all said and done, and I was talking to my class earlier today about this, ironically enough, and I said, the only way I can describe it is my soul ached mm. because you're like, not today. This can't end today. I don't want this to end today. And when we got back inside the wire in Fallujah, there was this tremendous immediate drain of oh, sure. all energy. Yeah. Mm. And that is probably the most difficult thing is for it. Again, I'm a Marine. I'm a staff guy. I'm a logistics guy. I'm not infantry. I didn't kick down doors for a living. If I can put it on a truck, a train, a boat, or an airplane, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to put it on my back. But at a certain point, everybody's got to do just that. And the people that have to do that sort of thing day after day after day, that is where you've got to be physically fit to do this for a living is absolutely essential to survival. I love it. Thank you for telling that story. Well, and it seems like it's so important for you to be able to save other people, like because you're going to have that emotional dump afterwards, whether it's like, I don't know if there's a lot of survival guilt or just like seeing your comrades not make it. So it seems like the better equipped you are to be able to help the people who you're serving with, the better you can prepare yourself emotionally in, in like an indirect way. Nikki, you nailed it. For me, the fact that I wasn't worried about getting tired in that moment, the fact that I wasn't stressed about, man, I'm just, this is too heavy. And I was able to function. I was able to perform in combat in that position. I was a leader as a leader should have. And I didn't have to worry about the fact that I was tired. I didn't have to worry about the fact that the gear was heavy or uncomfortable. I just did the job. And because I had developed the resilience of an athlete, I was able to demonstrate the resilience of a leader while all that was going on. And I was able to function and I was able to execute the way I was trained to execute. That's great. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. I want to turn a little bit to the, a little more practical to your experience in fitness so you have been a long time endurance athlete. You have run marathons, you've done Ironman triathlons. I mean, that's the endurance of endurance. But I know this from our discussions off the air. At some point, your body started to break down from all of the years of impact. Can you walk us through what that was like for you and your discovery of strength training and the impact it's had on your life since? So I never intended to be an endurance athlete. I think I mentioned the story to you very early on. So I was a plebe at the Naval Academy. They were making the announcements and they happened to say, the Marine Corps Marathon, we have spots that you can sign up if you want. 
And when the announcements were done, I turned around and leaning across the table was midshipman second class Alden Mills. You may know him from the perfect push up. And he is on his knuckles and he's looking me dead in my soul. And he's saying, you're going to run that marathon, aren't you, Mr. Conway? And I'm like, of course, I'm going to run that, sir. Absolutely. I couldn't dream of anything I'd rather do. I want to go do it right now. And once I did it, I had never run more than five miles before that. Wow. Uh, but once I did it, I realized, one, I was kind of OK at it. And two, I really enjoyed it. But I had no idea what I was doing. Like I said, I ran my first marathon having never run more than five miles. So I just, what I thought was I would just do more because more makes me better. And at the time, I just kind of emulated what I saw around me. And at that time, a lot of people just went running. That's what they did. And the Marine Corps tested the physical fitness test, which was pull-ups and crunches and a run. So I did those three things. And like you said, Matt, over time, it hurts, especially for the biggins, those of us who are over 200 pounds, the high impact of the intensity. And I thought that soreness was a mark of a good workout, but soreness quickly evolved into pain. And when I hit 40, I wasn't able to keep up with the youth that I saw. And I had resigned myself probably about two and a half, three years ago. I had just accepted my fate. Like, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm just going to have to be happy getting what I can and I'm going to spend some more time in physical therapy, I guess, until I started resistance training. And then I realized, one, I always thought there was a myth you could be fit or you could be strong. But I was able to shatter that myth and realize that you can be fit and you can be strong. And I'd been doing it wrong for all those years. And I was able to do resistance training and incorporate that into some of the cardiovascular training that I sustained over time, the lower impact. And it enabled me to... One, reignite my passion for working out. And two, it restored my faith that even beyond my time in the Marine Corps, because everybody gets out of the Marine Corps, I was going to be able to sustain a level of fitness that I had never known before hmm. because I took the pain away. I took the high impact away. I maintained the intensity. I still have the camaraderie in the weight room, if you will, but I could keep it going and I could keep it going for the foreseeable future. It's perfect. How old are you now? 50. How do you feel today at 50 compared to how you felt at 40 when you were broken? I mean, do you feel even better than you did 10 years ago? And also pre-Jillian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can tell you, I can never remember feeling as in control of my body as oh, I am right now. I mm. love that. Yeah. That's my favorite. I am relatively pain-free. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, I mean, you put insert number here on the barbell and put the barbell on your back, you're going to feel something as a result of that, especially when you're doing ascending sets of five. <laughs> but it's deadlift day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and you've got 30 years of impact that while you can, right. what you've done is you've tremendously built up the muscles around the joints to be able to handle a lot of right to be able to support the joints in a way that they hadn't been able to originally right but oh, they're no. still no I'm sure your knees don't look great on an MRI they can't right and probably your hips and ankles and, and just because there's a lot of stuff you can't truly reverse in those years of impact but certainly you've been able to I have slowed the degradation Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. kind of build the bubble wrap around yeah. your joints with the muscle. While increasing the function. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's funny, funny ironic, not funny haha, -ha, or maybe funny haha, -ha, I don't know. But if you look at my promotion pictures, because in the military, like we actually send a picture into the promotion board and you get one done every year. And it's a very specific way that you stand. It's a very specific uniform that you wear. I mean, we replicate it to the individual every single time. But if you look at my picture from a couple of years ago and you look at my picture now, you're like, holy crap. I thought my ability to build muscle was gone. I'm like, well, I'm over 40. Well, it's mm -hmm. goodbye muscles. Mm -hmm. You know, can't do that anymore. Wrong. Mm -hmm. I have been able to balance my body from strength and endurance in the lower half to much more of a symmetrical, strong frame. And I love the way that, I hate to say it this way, I love the way that I look. I love what I can do. Sure. I love mm -hmm. the fact that what used to sideline me for a little bit, now I'll recover from much faster and be able to do it all over again, which is great in Vermont because it snows all the time up here. <laughs> <laughs>
and you're working with students every day that are these college kids who are 20 years old and you're able to keep up with them at 50, which is really cool. You're able to lead by example, not out of, oh, this guy used to be mm -hmm. this. Right. But no, I can show up today and I can hold my own and lead this group, even though I'm 30 years older than the rest of you. I want that walk in the room credibility. I want to look the part. I don't yeah. want anyone saying, dad bod. I don't want that. I want to walk in the room and have people say, I need to sit up a little bit straighter. I need to pay attention to this gentleman or we have female leaders that do the exact same thing. And I want to pay attention to this man or woman because they're who I want to be in my future. Right. You have to set the standard for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's one of our leadership principles is setting the example. I don't just want to go out there and hang with these kids. I want to go out there and set the standard for them. And it's not because it's anything about my pride or anything, but I want them to understand this is the expectation. If you want to be on this team, this is the level that we expect you to perform. Because when it comes down to it, our Marines and sailors, those young men and women that we as leaders work for, they deserve the extra effort. Sure. It's good. I feel like there's a part in everybody who will be reassured when they know that they can just kind of be mediocre as they age and kind of be like, well, you know what? I'm over 45. It's okay. I've done my job. I'm just going to look the way I end up looking. And people, some people just want that. And then other people, like, when they see you, they're going to find that other part of themselves where they're just like, no, screw that. Like, I am going to be yeah. fit. I'm going to be jacked. I'm going to live a really robust life then. And like, you it, it help people yet. identify with that part of themselves. That's right. Absolutely. It is not over yet. And I'm telling you, I never thought it was possible. And had I not done it myself, I wouldn't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And Jesus knows it's still a little bit of pride in there too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun going in and being able to to kick ass with a bunch of 20 year olds. It It is, <laughs> but I don't do it for me. That's fair. So that's the difference. I don't want people looking like, how can I be like you? And like, look, don't be like me. Be the best version of you that yeah. you can be. And that's what our Marines and sailors, that's what they expect. And that's what they respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Hey, thanks for telling your story. We're so excited to be able to have you on this series, to be able to share some of your years of experience and wisdom and things that you've gleaned over the last three decades. Really, I'm excited to be able to have you on the podcast. So we got lots of fun things to talk about in future podcasts. You'll be on some of them, and we've got other wonderful members of the armed services that are on to tell their stories as well. But this is a great kickoff of this military series. So thanks for being on it, man. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Would love to have a five-star review from you. Share this with a family member or a friend, especially somebody that's in the armed forces, to help. We just want to help, right? That's what it comes down to. We want to be able to take this wisdom and experience and be able to communicate it out to others so that they can also learn from it. So we will see you soon in episode two. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What a great interview. He intimidates me and I've not even seen the man. I, I didn't watch the YouTube <laughs> version of this, but boy, talk about credibility and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I think the thing I want to start off with first is I totally empathize with his experience when he described arriving at the Naval Academy and feeling immediately mediocre. Yeah. It's not uncommon for people to be, like he described, a big fish in a small pond in their little town, Nowhereville, USA. They show up to these big centralized training environments mm -hmm. and you find yourself no longer the hottest thing in town. I empathize with that. Yeah. I, I thought I was a pretty in shape, fast, smart guy. And then I showed up and I've got like a Calvin Klein model for a roommate and I was not fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely something that I empathize with. Well, and that's that's kind of how the Air Force operates. Yeah. From the beginning, obviously, they're at OTS. We select the best of the best. And so the best are all there. The same is also true at the Air Force Academy. That's the Ivy League equivalent school. And so those are the people that they bring into the Air Force. It's not so much the case for Air Force ROTC until you get much later into the program once a lot of the filtering has taken place. Yeah. But then later on in the Air Force, especially on the operations side, I think about like what the experience must be showing up to the weapons school. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. They don't send a bunch of Joe Schmoes to the weapons school. They send literally the best and brightest. Yeah. Like the shiniest pennies they can find go there. And I can't even imagine what it would be like sitting in a room with you know, a bunch of 500 pound brains with all of the experiences they've had. It's got to be just awesome. And and not just awesome in like it's way super cool, but just like it fills you with awe. 
mm -hmm. to be around all of these people. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing of that memory for me is first, wow, I'm not as cool as I thought it was. So good bit of humble pie there. But also, boy, I am really excited to make this my profession. Yeah. To work with all of these people who are so amazing. So just a little bit of, yeah, totally understood how that felt. But the first thing I really wanted to dive into, Colin, and I think we should spend some time on this. He shared a very incredible story about when he was a senior officer in the convoy and they were subject to a complex attack. I think it was an RPG, but yeah. Yeah, so complex attack on the convoy. So one vehicle was struck. And as they gathered around the vehicle to help the people in the vehicle, then small arms fire, ambush. Yeah. Unfortunately, way too common during those conflicts in OIF and OEF. And he talks about how his physical fitness allowed him to get through that experience. Mm -hmm. And when he was asked, like, what was it that helped him endure? He talked about how the thing that drove him to action was that he couldn't be afraid of dying. Like, he couldn't, not now, this can't happen right now, yeah. we've got stuff to do. That was really poignant for me, and I really appreciate his being vulnerable and sharing that incredibly personal experience. But it made me think about some situations I've been in and also reflected a little bit about how being a member of the Air or the Space Force is different than infantry combat that he was experiencing. And, and thank goodness for that. Yes. We all have our roles, right? And I don't know how many airmen are going to be in a situation like that. Yes, it's happened. And yes, it will happen. We've got our battlefield airmen who are more likely to encounter that type of situation. But that's a pretty small percentage of us. However, I think we are going to have many opportunities where you are going to be making decisions that are just as critical and I think just as he described, your personal individual readiness and fitness will be critical to your ability to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And it made me reflect back on my deployment to the CAOC in 2014. I know I talk about it a lot, but it was a big deal to me. And I remember pretty early, I was making decisions about an asset that was going to go fly. And the decision was, is it going to fly at this time or is it going to fly at this time? Now, that may not seem like a big deal, yeah, but I had one of them. And I had way more need for that platform than I had platform. And it wasn't just a small difference. It was, hey, you're going to have to tell everybody that they're waking up 12 hours earlier than they expected. And everything's going to have to change. It's going to have to change the maintenance schedule. It's going to have to change the gas schedule. It's going to have to change all these people's sleep. It was a pretty substantial difference. And I just remember the staff sergeant looking at me. And I, you know, here I am, <laughs> Lieutenant Gann, and she's just looking at me. <laughs> and it hit me. No one else is coming to save you. Like, you have to make this call. And made a decision, and it got easier from there. <laughs> you know, yeah. That was early on in the deployment. But the point remains that your individual readiness and your resilience and your ability to manage the situation is heavily reliant on your individual fitness. And even though I wasn't running up and down encouraging my men in a gun battle, and I don't want to equate my decision-making at the chaos to that. I, that would yeah. be inappropriate, and I don't want to right. do that. But to the men and women who are on the ground fighting the war, having that asset overhead felt very much the same. So right. it was still a big deal to them. And I was making decisions with lives. These were airmen who were flying into harm's way. So it was also not unserious at the same time. Just right. different, right? It's not better, not worse, just different how important fitness was in that idea. And I think it's the same for our airmen in decision-making. And Colin, I know you and I talked about this with our students. They get stuck in the ooh. If you think about the OODA loop, right? Observe, yeah. orient, decide, and act. They'd get paralyzed and they get stuck in the ooh. And that was not acceptable. Unable to make a decision. Yeah. That's what that means. Exactly. And we can't afford that. We especially can't afford that in time-sensitive situations. Yeah, so let's take a couple steps back why do we care about fitness at all? I mean, why does the Air Force and the military as a whole put so much emphasis on fitness? We get it in the context of the Marines and the Army, just like this story that Colonel Conway shared, so that in the time of combat, you are ready to fight, that you're able to run up and down the convoy and 
not completely fall apart and become so exhausted that you can't make a decision and then act. Even more basic than that, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Colin, but have you ever been in a fight? No, I have not. Okay, have you ever wrestled? Yes. Okay, how exhausting is wrestling? I'm talking like the no kidding, formal, high school, middle school, okay, here's your weight class, okay, start. Right. It is one of the most physically taxing things I've ever done. Yeah, I've not done it in wrestling, but I've done it in martial arts, yeah, grappling, exactly. jiu-jitsu, yeah, that kind exactly. of thing. Yes. Yeah. In 30 seconds, you can take a very fit person and absolutely reduce them to a crumbling bag of meat. Yeah. It is incredibly physical. And that's what we do. We fight. <laughs> Those yeah. are fighting sports, right? So yes, it is incredibly intense physical experience. So yeah, it's even more basic, I think, than that. Like it's not always putting on Kevlar or putting on a helmet carrying a gun. It's even way more basic than that. Yeah. And the point is that we don't want you to turn into a crumbling mass on the floor. We want you to be available. And that's really what this is all about. Yeah. Is being available to the Air Force when they need you. Because you signed up for that. <laughs> exactly. And that is as simple as your body being present in your billet, in your chair, when the Air Force needs you. And if you are not physically capable of doing that, then that's a problem. Because we don't have an unlimited number of bodies to take that position. You were just saying about at the KOC, you were the guy, the only person who could make that decision. If you weren't there, either that decision wasn't going to get made or it was going to be very much delayed until somebody else who had the authority and the training to make that decision was put in place. Yeah, I still can't get that vision of that staff sergeant is looking at me like over her glasses, <laughs> like, OK, LT, like, come on. Anyway, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we care about this is so that we can be available. But I want to take it another step further, put it into the officer and leadership context that it's not just about you as an officer being available physically, but you being available as a leader. That if you, for some reason, because of your level of fitness are not available to not just be there, but you cannot lead, then you are now also failing. And this is one of the reasons why I love this story, but also just this whole episode and interview that Colonel Conway did, because later on, he talks a little bit more about this again. He says that the resilience that you develop as an athlete can directly translate into the resilience that you can later exhibit as a leader. And resilience is kind of one of those buzzwords that gets thrown around a lot. But the idea here is that you don't crumble like you were talking about as a wrestler in the face of adversity and hardship, but you remain available and capable of making those decisions and then acting on them and helping your people to do the same toward the accomplishment of a mission. So those are some of my thoughts around this, that we care about these kinds of things so that we can lead our people and help the mission get done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And something else as we're talking about this, he also talked about walk in the room credibility. Ooh, yeah. Really good. And we are human beings with flaws and weaknesses. And as soon as you see another human being for the first time, you make judgments. Mm -hmm. It's built in, it's hard coded in your DNA as a, you know, creature that lives on this earth. You are going to do that because we evolved in the jungles and in the plains and we want to live and not die. So it's baked in. Biology says so. And that walking credibility begins with the second someone sees you. And what a better way to demonstrate your ability to lead at least yourself mm, yeah, than being fit. And you can see it. You can see it. And we've all been in that situation where we see the people who are not leading themselves in terms of fitness. Yeah. Because it's right there for everyone to behold. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons it plays such a central role in OTS and ROTC and USAFA. If you can't put your poop in a group enough to pass a PFA, I'm not certain that I can then extend that same belief in your ability to lead a large organization. Yeah. So let's start with you. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Colin. Let's start with Reed. Let's start with a big A airman everywhere. Lead yourself. 
That's another thing I really like about fitness. And I thought he captured that well in that phrase, that walk in the room credibility. That's where yeah. it starts. It absolutely does. But you have to remember that it's not about you. We will start with you. Yes. You have to lead yourself. But remember, you need to lead yourself so that you can lead others because yes. it's never about you. Yes. It's never about you looking good in front of a whole bunch of people. That's never what this is about. Yeah. And Colonel Conway didn't cross those two at all. He made that very right. clear. And I thought he did a good job of covering that. But yeah, Colin, I was really grateful we're able to bring the audience the interview with Colonel Conway. And I think it's an excellent way to kick off this series on fitness. I thought he did a great job of connecting what seems to be like a disparate appendix almost to military life, but showing how central it is to our ability to not only accomplish the mission, which is frankly the point, yeah. but also our ability to lead other people to mission accomplishment. Which is also the point. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And this is just the first of more to come. The next episode, you'll hear more from Colonel Conway as he gets even deeper into leadership and resilience. And then some additional episodes after that, you'll hear from me talking about the Air Force and the military fitness culture. And through all of this, we will continue to offer our thoughts on the importance of fitness what the structure of Air Force Fitness is currently, what we think it should be. So we invite you to stick around. Let us know what your thoughts are on these same topics. You can reach out to us through Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com. Send us messages through various social media platforms so that we can have these conversations together. Awesome. I think that'll do it. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed.